and uh, I watched my own and I was like, oh my God, I should update it since I've learned so much more just from the conference. It's funny because you actually have updated it once after. Oh, I, I, yeah, so that's, there's everything is evolving all the time. It's evolving. Yeah, I kept adding more things and adjusting and adding uh, that Mokohunga sisters are just exploded with so much more information right while I was writing the paper uh, a month ago. Jennifer, that was fabulous. Thank you. It took like a lot of months <laughs> to put that together. It shows. <laughs> it shows. It is really dense. Thank you. Appreciate it. That's one of the things I really appreciate about Jennifer is that she gives you so much history and so much in information, such an education in her presentations. Thank you. Well, Thank that you. that quarter um, artist, what's it? Ella's, I can't pronounce his first name, but mm -hmm. I saw his Mokohanga woodcuts at the Whitney last year and I was blown away. I had no idea about him and they're beautifully printed. But you found out that he had studied in Japan. He traveled there. He actually he learned from Sakino. So Sakino came to New York City, and oh. um, he worked at Pratt. And I think that Elzer were, um, was at Pratt at around the same time. And they were kind of like kind of in the area around that time. And around that time, he was also working at the Blackburn Print Shop. And so that was yeah. about 1958 or so, something like that. Mm -hmm. So it's just interesting how small knit that printmaking community was, even though they were. At, you know, different parts of living in New York City, they're able to come together and um, and learn from one another. I'm not quite sure, like, how did they actually meet? But I know that Sakino worked a lot with um, Elder to help help him with that tech with the technique That's of so Mokohanga. <laughs> and uh, I mean, I don't know how many people are familiar with the the New York City print shop, but there's three print shops in New York, and Bob Blackburn's has been an important source for information and teaching for, well, since the 50s, I guess. And it's, he died, what, five or 10 years ago? But his uh, workshop still exists. Definitely. I think Kate McKenna, I think, worked there. I don't know if she's on. Who, who's that? Kate worked there for a little oh, while. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Pat, did you yeah. have something to say? Yes, I have a comment and, and two questions. The comment is what I liked about all three presentations that is that you see the work in a much broader context with many other many other influence, including the history, but as as well as the connections of other artists. And it looks completely different when you see that wider context. Um, my questions are in a couple of not just um, faith, but in other presentations, we've seen printing on fabric. And I'm wondering if the same inks and techniques are used when printing on fabric. And the second question is, are all these um, um, discussions being recorded as well? And will they be available? Please. To answer the last first, yes, everything will be available. Mara is is our technical video person. She's going to upload them. Um, as far as printing on fabric, it's a different technique. Somebody addressed that yesterday. Who was printing? Oh, um, Irena Kekas was printing on fabric, and she said yeah. it's a different kind of ink, not, okay. not the same Sumi ink. Okay. But I, I noticed that, Faith, your, one of your first works was printed on fabric as well. Um, no, the early painting I showed was a painting, and that was on oh. fabric. I oh. have printed on fabric. Printed but on use fabric. Oil. I use oil basing when I do that. Got it. Got it. Okay. And it's true. All three of these, all it was funny that Ralph organized the three of these together because each of the three, sorry, is in a t is putting putting Mokuhanga in a broader context, where some of our earlier talks were more about individual uh, approaches. Yeah, I, I will say one more, time, one more time, I think Ralph did a wonderful job with organizing the shadow. I mean, it's just perfect. Just everything in, interconnects with each other. Organizing by, not just by time zone and by interest. 
Um, uh, let's see, a Alex, you had a question? Alex? Uh, yes, yes. Yes, I have. <laughs> Uh, at first, I'd like to thank you, April, for this beautiful joke of including me in this presentation. But my question is for Faith. Okay. Um, so, Faith, uh, I'm uh, about the uh, original blocks for this Buddhist um, tankas, yes? Mm -hmm. um, because it's it's um, I've never seen seen it in person but they seems like wonderfully carved yes. oh yes yeah so it's almost uh, like perp perpendicular cutting uh, of these blocks yes am i right there's still an angle there's a sharp angle um it i mean i'm guessing it's about 45 degrees that and they use a different kind of wood and the cuts are are quite deep they're about um, more than a quarter of an inch deep. This is one that I picked up recently that is a Tibetan block. So yeah. maybe look at it. Yeah. Mm. And these are uh, pretty deep carved, right? Um, they carved them deep. I use Sheena um, and I carved reasonably deep, <laughs> but not as deep as they do. But I mean the original uh, blocks uh, made by Tibetan people or Nepalian. Because yeah. they so, would make hundreds and maybe even thousands of prints. That's kind of interesting. By the way, April, yesterday you showed this process of printing of those those sutras. Yes, that was um, Claire. Claire. Claire, yeah, yeah, in yeah. Nepal, uh, she, uh, yeah, she but, found a library that had the blocks. But this crazy, crazy printing process when people are printing uh, like hundred prints for oh, um, going back and forth. Yeah, that was yeah. uh, was, ne Nepali printing, I believe. So it was not this kind of printing, right? Um, they do similar to the original Buddhist Buddhist uh, woodblocks in Japan, where at first um, they were just a simple Buddha, and then they were hand painted and. Uh, Tibet did the same thing. They paralleled this one on for hundreds of years, then it stopped in Japan, but it never stopped in uh, Tibet. And many of the Tibetan covers went to Nepal um, until the communist invasion. And then Tonka painting survived, but not so much the woodblocks. Yeah, but talking about carving, because do you have an idea how it was originally carved uh, by mm, the monks or? What kind of tools do they use or something like this? Do you mostly have... chisels, yeah, mostly chisels. It's and... also on types because uh, I was wondering how, how did they carve um, those blocks because they are really beautiful carved. Mm -hmm. And um, to, just to say, because in, in Poland, we had also kind of traditional folk woodcut, which is pretty similar. I mean, in terms of um, how does the blocks look like? Mm -hmm. And I was asking in the Ethnographical Museum and specialists mm -hmm. uh, how, how it was carved and they don't know. So maybe, maybe looking <laughs> in Nepal <laughs> yeah. or Tibet uh, would be well, enough. Um, some of the, uh, like Tajikistan or some of those places when they have the special crafts where they do the tiny work and like the eggs, those people are already very good. It's really spread widely now the Tibetan painting style um, to um, what was the former Soviet Union is now very, there are a lot of Tibetan painters, um, but they're Russian or whatever area they're from, but they just have, they're really good at it, but not so much the wood carving still hasn't, um, is not there yet. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you're not so clear about what kind of tools they had or what the... Mm. Uh, no, I, I've never oh. met a Tibetan carver. I know lots of Tibetan painters, um, but I've, I've yet to meet a carver. Um, you so can see they're carved more deeply than the Japanese ones, so... It must have been a slightly different approach, but yeah. yeah, I suspect it was just knives. You know, it looks like maybe, but a lot of I, knife work rather than gouges. Yeah, yeah. So we have these beautiful blocks, and we don't know how it's carved. Yeah, 
Well, they're, it's not completely extinct, so they're still doing it. And this book, the Dersh Prakang book, um, it's called Pearl of the Snowlands. We had talked about it earlier. That shows some people carving, and it does look like they're using knives. And it just shows also just the simple, um, the simple tonkas. Oh, Bill, where'd you go? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. I enjoyed it a lot. And thank you, April. Thank you so much. I, I'm still here, April. Okay, because I saw just, Bill had a question. I wanted to... No, uh, yeah, I was just going to add a comment about printing on textiles, but it, the conversation had moved on. But at any rate, Gamblin makes Drive-By Black, which is an oil-based ink formulated for printing on relief prints on textiles. Mm -hmm. So, uh -huh. so, so that's, And that's easily accessible if you yeah. want to print on... If you want to print on fabric, you do not want to use Sumi ink. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Okay. Um, let's see. When I was organizing my talk, oh, I think when Gina's a question, if you raise the hand emoji, won't John? Yeah, my raise the hand emoji is the same color as my background, and it doesn't get seen. <laughs> So I have a question for Faith and maybe anyone else who's been in Japan. Um, when I was there, I remember going to a temple and printing a Buddhist block in a very ritualistic fashion in the same sense as if I was making a prayer. Mm -hmm. And I remember somebody telling me that you could print these wooden blocks on smoke or on water if the blocks had been worn away so much that you couldn't print them on paper. And so I'm really interested to see whether you have any recollection or source for this kind of idea of the ritualistic aspect of offering up a prayer through the medium of print. Do you have, does anyone have any information on this very quite beautiful kind of performance? Where did you aspect? have the opportunity to print these blocks? Temples. Somewhere. Temples in Japan? Yeah. It was at least 20 years ago, so I can't remember. But it was yeah. in Japan. In Japan, when I was in Seika, yeah. They're so. quite common still as stamping, and they think of it, um, I don't know if you know the word mantra, but that would be like the repetition of a positive thought. Um, and so with the stamping of the Buddhas, it's that similar kind of thing. It's almost like repetition. It's a meditation practice in and of itself. So that carried on where the, the larger Buddha wood blocks that were uh, from hundreds of years before disappeared, but the stamping is still very prominent today. They're also using, they're really big in Naras where you can see a, a, a lot of them. Um, is some of the best repositories are in Nara. And they're also used to stuff the statues. So that oh, it's put it inside the statue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you can get your book stamp that, um, you visited so many temples. Like I know Lucy, when we were in um, we were in the 2017 conference or residency together, she then went and visited something like 20 or 40 temples. It's a kind of historic and tour. Chicago. Yeah. So she may have some knowledge of that too. Hi, hello. <laughs> Thanks, Faith. Sure. Um, I what I remember from that pilgrimage is um, it was the Shikoku 88 temple pilgrimage. Oh, Andre's done that too, 2009, he just said. Um, and I don't remember anything to do with printing there, Winjin, but I do remember just being mesmerized by the calligraphy um, that was done by the monks at each temple when you got your um, book stamped. But their, their use of with sumi ink and a brush was exquisite. And then the three red stamps that came with that. I never remember seeing any woodblock printing done. Sorry. So, so that was a, a calligraphy rather than a stamp or both? It was both April. So you would have um, three stamps depicting the temple you were visiting. And I think the year that you were there and then the monk would um, perform the calligraphy by hand on top of those stamps, which you take with you from temple to temple. Yeah. How fabulous. Yeah, it's, I think they become very, very valuable books by temple kind of 80, because you've probably collected all of those. So you keep, you keep it very close to you, that whole, that whole period of walking. And it's 88 temples? 
it's 88 temples but um I only I had 30 days so I managed 40 I stopped at 45 I've got the rest to do <laughs> when I go back you're gonna go back of course you have to finish the circle complete the circle I plan to do that next year wonderful <laughs> and, um way to eat <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I wanted to also um, just bring up that Jennifer is um, the first one to really directly uh, deal with political and then also the social and racial, racial issues that are so prominent um, now and also representing her culture, which I think is just amazing. Thank you for your hard work, um, Jennifer, in that field, because artists really can change how everybody sees things through. And we've always done, you know, artists have always been the ones to create a lot of political change or social change. I think, I think, thank you, Faith, for, for that comment. I feel like we've always been documenting, you know, the lives in which we live all the time. And I think one of my favorite artists, it's a little gory, but he really had a lot of um, um to him. And I think Yoshitoshi, I think I saw those prints in person for the first time at the Philadelphia Museum of Art the same time that I did a workshop. I did like a bunch of blocks. I had the workshop, I did a demonstration that day and I had a chance to make blocks that were um, inspired by our small little samples of, of some of his prints. And so these are for children. So I definitely can't show the, the <laughs> blood and the gore. You know, I gotta find interesting textures, interesting, you know, maybe there's a fish, maybe there's maybe there's something, a wind mark that I can make yeah. in these blocks that were good for, for for children to print from and I feel like just being as my first time ever seeing them in person and I feel like I, I want to even go more not to make things gory but just to really well, they reflected his you know, his period when there was so much social upheaval during the early Meiji mm -hmm. but the other thing Jennifer that you've done I know from another show is to try to um, to educate young black children and make them proud of their culture. Like you just had that uh, exhibit in Vermont where it used different dolls and things to show. But you said that your daughter, your young daughter was like, oh, that looks like me. And mm -hmm. that's also why I've been doing the everyday goddesses um, is so that people um, can see, because that's part of the idea of yoga philosophy is that we're all you know, divine, um, so that people can see that. And sometimes entire races and cultures are left out of that work. And so I think it's really important to include them. Yeah, I just want, I just want to echo um, Faith's comments there. We're, well, I am pretty busy trying to get together a social practice of an art and design major here at our university. And, um, our strategic goals are really not only in our department, but within the university, very much aligned with um, equity, diversity, and inclusion. So to see this format and this technique, and then Jennifer, to see you really push this additional perspective or angle or perspective on it, it is really a treat. And it, um, just reminds me so much as we get going with this that we're going to be able to use this kind of major to to really to use our medium to talk about some bigger super important human and kind issues so thank you i've got to run to meeting i'll i'll catch up later thanks okay. lovely to see you well I, I think the format of the conference as a whole is about inclusivity i mean you know we're all cross-cultural already so it's great to have more inclusivity within our inclusivity um anybody else have want to make a comment any oh charles, oh, has a question. charles what's up <laughs> okay so this is a question for both uh faith and jennifer uh, and i'd like to um hear how both of you think about print um, as uh, serving as an information technology first, right, to facilitate change. Uh, you know, I've been very interested in this for a while. Um, and whether it's like uh, grassroots activism, right, like uh, hand carving prints really fast on a 
low budget to get information out there quick or uh, making tangible uh, prayer cards. I'd like to know how you guys view print as a, uh, uh, as a craft to spread information fast. Jennifer, you want to information to information that serves well information that serves a function. <clears throat> mm. Well, I think as, as it serves as a function, I think it's just like for me, I'm interested in the stories that people don't know, the people who are overlooked, and making sure that I look as look for as much information as I can, researching really a lot of detail. Like even in the paper, I was like, wow, I don't want to get anything, you know like wrong or overlooked. And I wanted to make sure I got every detail looking at tons of sources. I think it, I think it's important for me to do as much as the legwork as, as I can. And then from there, I take that information and then a print is born. But I do a lot of like research of like, you know, whether it be reading, whether looking at videos, looking at conversations of, of past artists. And I take all the information to make my work. And I feel like information is given by, you know, well, like this, is nothing new. This has repeated. So I try to find common themes and common social issues that have been repeated over and over and over. And I just remix it to make it be, you know, modern day print. But I'm mm -hmm. constantly looking at history. And I think history tells you the information. It's just a matter of what what you wanna what you wanna like pretend that you don't picking, know. It's picking the telling image, the telling detail. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's just for me. And what I've done is I've tried to, I'm involved with um, printmakers uh, as resistance or printmakers as racism. So I'll take, um, voting rights are really important to me and also representation, you know, inclusivity. And so I'll do, I'll do work around that and donate it to um, like the Black Lives Matter movement, the things that you care about. Mm -hmm. You can use your voice as an artist to kind of support the things you care about. Right. And Faith, what about those prayer cards that you were talking about, like going to the uh, Buddhist temples? Um, they remind me of a, uh, um, a technology I stumbled upon back in 2010 when I did my MFA at uh, University of Arizona. Uh, there's these, uh, I started learning a, a lot just about like Spanish Catholic culture because of the, the area. And they have these uh, milagros there are essentially tangible prayers and like these, like these very beautiful tin uh, sculptures and you know, uh, they'll be like in a very rudimentary shape of like a foot or a hand and they can mean all these different things, right? Mm -hmm. You can attach a meeting, uh, like several different meanings to the foot or to the hand sculpture. And, uh, and since I, I learned about these, I've been trying to find ways uh, to do the same thing with print. <laughs> right uh making like these really cheap disposable uh not necessarily disposable but cheap woodblock prints that you can fold up into your pocket or and wallet or something like that but when you print it you kind of embed this like like you said before like this function of um like a positive affirmation so i just love to learn more about like your thoughts on that um so I think that Claire also talked about that when she, she hmm. I was really interested in her presentation because it was a Nepalese man who had gone to Japan to study and then realized he already knew woodblocks, but that his grandfather had done it. They'll often, um, the Tibetans will often print on a piece of paper and then fold it up very carefully and make it like an amulet to, um, hmm. to protect you. Um, we do things like medicine Buddha where you can have a small medicine Buddha for somebody that's sick. Uh, oh. it, I think there's a lot of parallels in um, <laughs> in uh, spirituality of all traditions. <laughs> Faith sent me a medicine Buddha when I was here caring for my father. I have uh, to thank you. That was so nice. I, I think Charles, you have a point, a good point about those uh, those presentations because it. It kind of referenced to the roots of woodblock. I mean, mm -hmm. the reproduction of the information quick and cheap, you know? Mm -hmm. So this is kind of rooted in this fleet kind of printing that distributes the information as, as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So this is 
kind of dimension of the wood block, which is for me very interesting. So uh, you had a good point about those. I think so. Thank you. I think so Myla had a question, but we cannot really see our hand, Myla, as a I know because it's all brown back there. Um, I just wanted to um, thank the three presentations, really enjoyed it. But I also wanted to add, um, you know, I'm in Hawaii and everything is shipped in. And so part of the social um, consciousness is sustainability. And we've been kind yeah. of been on a movement where, you know, we're, I'm making our paper. And that's why I, I yesterday asked a question about native dyes and we're looking at creating our own pigments and not have everything shipped all the time. And, you know, bringing things in. And I, I think the reason why I enjoy um, this art form is because of simplicity of what it does and to simplify more that we don't create more fuel burning, you know, to practice our art and, you know, and to think about that as well. So, I mean, I teach at the university and that's what we try to get our students to do is to plant their own plants, create their own dyes, you know, and figure out how we can use native um, knowledge within our practice. And um, Miley is a world-renowned uh, Hawaiian weaver. She, she often exchanges with um, New Zealand to, to preserve the culture. And she makes her own mulberry paper. She grows Hawaiian mulberry. To, um, she's a pretty amazing artist. <laughs> As an artist from New York City, there's no opportunity for me to make paper, but I think it's still very valuable to have access to that information as to recognize what goes into the paper and the ink and the materials that we do use. Mm -hmm. um, where, my screen keeps flipping around. I can see William has his... Yeah, hi. Oh, I got my my video turned off. Sorry. Um, I was just going back to this con this idea about uh, woodcuts as uh, being able to be printed fast and being used for social change. Um, at the Shiva Gallery at John Jay, uh, where I work, um, we had an exhibition on human rights and prints a few years ago, and two of the woodcuts that we showed were uh, from the students during the student rebellion in Korea against the dictatorship. And they rapidly, the students at the art schools rapidly, rapidly produced these woodcuts and distributed them as flyers to get people out in the streets and to, uh, and the students were instrumental in the overthrow of the dictatorship then. But that was 50 years ago. And, you know, if you flash forward, you have social media and yeah. it seems like that is so much faster. And if you just think about the Obama poster and how viral that went, you know, yeah. whole, you know, it went instantaneously viral. Now you could argue that the aesthetic is somewhat akin to, uh, to a graphic, the simplicity of the graphics that you get, the graphic image that you can get with a woodcut. So you could say that there's an aesthetic influence or a history of this, but it's interesting to see how technology takes away and gives at the same time. Um, so that's something I think that has to be considered when you talk about woodcuts as an element of change. And one final thing, is uh, the Shiva Gallery at John Jay is dedicated to uh, the many dimensions of justice. And we had a show planned for the Trump, uh, for the presidential election and social critical uh, prints, but it got waylaid by the pandemic. So it's gonna be <laughs> resurrected. So if anybody is interested in the, or has work that's involved with social justice themes, please contact me um, and I'd like to see what you're doing. And I'm oh, really quick. Right? Where is the Shiva Gallery? It's in it's at John Jay College in New York. New York. Uh, ah. we're William, if I may. Yeah, Bill. It's Bill. It's just that's I registered with my full name. Okay. It, yeah, if I may, no, thanks for uh, bringing it back up. Um, I'd love to. I'd love to see if you could like send a link to the exhibition. That would be wonderful. But um, uh, you know the the Obama poster. I just wanted to jump in and talk a little bit more about that since you brought it up. I. I love that image and you and the history behind it. And you talked about how okay they were um, the Koreans were printing these woodcuts 50 years ago. Um, the uh, like the Obama campaign image that we all like that we all know uh, so popular started as screen prints and yeah, uh, Shepard Ferry made it in a day. He sold 200, uh, printed 200 more, uh, and just kept selling out. And then uh, and then the image was sequentially. Uh, eventually acquired by the campaign. So it's still, 
like even though social media is spreading it and we a lot of people see that image in a digital form it originated that very same way as just you know making screen prints really fast um just like those woodcuts so uh that that handprint tech is still is still very relevant yeah yeah and the uh, one one thing about the social media and woodblock is that uh, What's the difference in the sense of dangerous? Mm. Da I mean, danger of this kind of um, spreading information that the woodblock can be really independent in the sense it's not in the virtual world. It's just can be um, give can, can you can make it in total secret, right? Uh, and then you can spread it. Mm in different way, I mean, truly independent. And mm -hmm. as, you, as you, you told about it, that social media later can, you know, how to say, make it bigger, but, but uh, the, I mean, the printmaking in general can be very independent, very more, just more than social media. That's my point. I, I, I see what you're saying. We can post things on Facebook and everybody sees it, but it's hard to evaluate where or when. If it's a print, you know exactly where and who, and it has a physicality and a present tense quality that social media doesn't have. I mean, it's the opposite that in uh, the woodblock and printmaking, drawing, something that's physically. Mm, mm, exist, uh, you cannot say who and where and what and when. You know? mm -hmm. In the social media, mm, it's basically kind of network, right? So it's not mm, in the terms of safety, it's not so safe. It might be more dangerous than anything you can do by hand. In this term, when you draw, when you print, when you do something like this, you can be independent. Right. So that's just. I love nice. this idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that I think that that's such a wonderful mm -hmm. idea. This is kind of thing about the printmaking in general, which always fascinated me. That I can do something that I want, uh, that I'm interested in. I can prepare something in in total. Um, I mean, independently, without any people around me that are looking at what are am I doing and and stuff. So this is like something interesting about printmaking, drawing, painting and stuff like this. That's so interesting. And April, your talk too was so informative and just a continuation of, you know, you brought us the knowledge of so many artists, so many great artists through your book. And to have that continue is really wonderful and expand. Well, I was trying to give an overview because we have so many strong independent voices here, but I was like trying to make sense out of the whole thing. Oh, so much going on. Um, but that was my attempt to make sense out of this uh, gr still growing enterprise that was started really by Keiko Kadota um, with her idea about cross-cultural communication and including people from different countries in the conversation. I wish I had met her. <laughs> Just an amazing... Well, she was very eccentric, though. I mean, she had her own ideas for doing things that were. I had never met anybody like her. Yeah, very mysterious woman. You know, you never knew what she was thinking or what she was doing, and you know, you just see things appear. I'm like Keiko, where did that come from? You know, she's like, <laughs> I got, I got these, I got these uh vegetables from next door. You know, and it's like, wow, I'll eat them. You know, say so, so. And so in 2015. You know, I said, I said, wow, I said, this is an amazing 
woman. I said, this is why I wanted to continue to demonstrate and teach. And she's like, you can teach Malcolm on this. She's like, contact April. And I was like, April, look, I gotta, I gotta keep that. working. She told me to do that. So I said, I gotta contact April to remind her. Um, but Keiko told me, you know, so I, I was really honored to the fact I got a chance to live with her for just a month. And I had no idea that she was even sick. Like, I just know she would go away to the city. I have a doctor's appointment and she'd come back. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. and you know, she just amazing. Um, her health was she very here. <laughs> she, uh, when, when did she die? 2014, I think. 17, I think. Right before the conference What's in the Hawaii. Year before the conference. Oh, right before the 2017 conference in Hawaii. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So 2016, maybe. Yeah, I wrote an obituary for her that you can find on. Uh, yeah, I think it was she. She passed away at the end of the year, and I remember reading yeah. your obituary in January. Is it possible? I remember. Yeah. Oh, actually, it was Won John. You published it in um, in printmaking today, right? You contacted me and asked me to write something. Yeah, maybe. I'm really sorry. <laughs> you don't remember? Yeah. I have a. I do remember that. Yes, I do. Remember yeah, and that. so there was a short yeah. segment about what I remembered of her, because yeah. the people in Japan aren't gonna, it was really hard to find out her birth date and things like that. Um, um, so I was sort of reconstructing some pieces of her life for the obituary because nobody was really very forthcoming in, in Japan. Um, yeah, she, she set up the Hawaii conference and arranged all the people, but she wasn't able to come. She sort of handed it over, handed it over to Setsuko, mm-hmm. who followed through on her plans for that conference. And talking about Keiko Kagota, it's my just memory about her, and that she had really good sense of humor, which was <laughs> yes uh, <laughs> hidden hidden behind this her style. Yep. But I always felt like she was laughing at me and at what I'm doing. <laughs> and I remember I showed her my tools. So I brought some like big chisels <laughs> like this. <laughs> I don't know. And she she had she must have had some very good fun out of me. And it was always with her like we are talking seriously, but she she includes those little jokes in, in the conversation that was really I really liked her it was definitely funny I went over there and I was like wait I'm gonna have to go to the store I gotta buy food so I went and bought all this food might we had to walk you know 30 40 minutes to the store back and this forth was at me at, at me lab at me lab yeah and I had too much food I couldn't carry it and I was like oh gosh and so we had to carry all this food on our backs I was like, Keiko, can you take this back to the house for me? And she's like, you didn't come to Japan to come eat. You came to make Mako Hunga. And I'll never forget that. I was like, wow. So she thought I had too much food. I, I couldn't care. Everyone's walking back with their food. because we, we didn't drive. Like she drove her car there and mm-hmm. met us at the store. But we had to walk back with our food. And so from that moment, I said, wow, I got to really focus on less on eating and making sure I make as much prints as possible. So she definitely had... A sense of hum- humor, Alexander, that's for sure. Yeah. So the same yeah, thing happened to me, Jennifer. Yeah. Um, the, the, when in 2014, when I, when, when I was at Me Lab, um, I came back the first week with a ton of food from that grocery store. And I guess she walked into the kitchen at the same time I came in and she said, like, Charles, you're a serious cook. <laughs> a serious cook and then <laughs> and then she instructed Hayato to teach me some Japanese recipes so Hayato starts showing me how to make like you I know recall, like like oh you, you you put ginger do you remember that Carol I recall she really liked you <laughs> a serious cook she was, oh I, she was quite formidable you kind of you never knew yeah. who you were with her <laughs> yeah that was so funny <laughs> I do remember that so poor Hayato is showing me how to make like you know, beef and chicken and ginger and all that. And Hayato is this intellectual who studied in London. <laughs> yeah. I was at I am I was at IMC in 2014 after the Get Eye conference and Hiroki Minoue was there too and 
and Keiko, and she gave each of us a really stiff brush to to brush away the um, the wood carvings, and I still have it and use it. And then Hiroki was working right along with us, and he made about eight prints, and he gave us each gave us one. He calls it life celebration. And it was one of those tassels that all the temples, the celebratory tassels. And so I was amazed. Wow. How, I was amazed how fast he <laughs> made prints <laughs> I mean, and dried them and handed them out to all of us. It was impressive. Wait a minute. Who was this? Sorry. Hiroki. Hiroki. Oh. Hiroki. Yeah, Hiroki is amazing. Yeah. 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 The probably one of the wildest demos I've ever seen. Like, I, like Carol, you were there. Remember when he, like the, the demo started off very slow and formal and technical. And by the end, he was just grabbing stuff left and right and printing on it. Wasn't even talking. And I like, <laughs> I like took this photograph after the demo was over and there's just like paper and ink everywhere. It's just, it was so great. I remember Hayato though, he had that, didn't he have that uh, film of him dressed up as James Bond or something like that? So. Oh yeah. <laughs> that was hilarious. Yeah. I was hoping we'd see more of Hayato at this conference. I haven't seen him. Oh, he's lovely. I saw him in London. It was, it was very odd though, out of context, it was very odd to meet him in London unexpectedly. <laughs> Yeah, he, he worked hard with um, Keiko. Yeah. But the great thing about Keiko was that she had an idea, like even a very rigid idea about what she wanted to accomplish. But she would never contradict you if you went off in a different direction. She would just kind of gently bring things back. And like you say, with a sense of humor, because she knew what she wanted and you couldn't really cross her. Yeah. I mean, you always ended up doing what she wanted. She was just very good with people. Yeah. I mean, she always made you feel like, oh, of course you want to do what she says. <laughs> I don't know if you guys also heard the story. Speaking of Hayato and Keiko, I think the, the origin story of how um, Hayato started working for Keiko, did other people Oh, he was from okay. the same area, right? Where she was? Uh, no, it might be, it might have been kind of a joke, but I think he, he kind of stumbled into the, um, the gallery um, at 3331 Shiota. And, you know, he, he joked a lot too, so he, he could have completely the made this story up. He would drink beer on the porch <laughs> and just laugh. Yeah, <laughs> but I think he said he was following a girl or something or just, but then he ended up with a job at the end because he stumbled into the gallery or something. So it was kind of funny. Well, I, I remember he was from, um, she was, she grew up in Tokyo, but then she married and moved to Shikoku to, to, to uh, what's the name of the city there at the north end of Shikoku? Starts with a T. She moved there because her husband was from mm. there and uh, Tokushima. Um, Hayato, Tokushima thank Tokushima. you John yeah so she um married and moved to Tokushima and raised two children there uh and yeah. and she also worked at Awagami for a while too and that was in the same area yeah she befriended yeah. all the paper makers she mm. was a city girl from Tokyo ended up in Shikoku and started befriending the local craftspeople especially the um, Awagami family who were making paper in central Chicago. Uh, but Hayato was from that same area. And I think she had a rapport with him because he lived in the same area that she was familiar with. She trusted him. She must have attracted similar people because um, Goto-san also has a really dry, kind of, uh, good sense of humor. And so does Shoichi. You know, they're all teasers and um, they, they have fun teasing us while they're teaching us. <laughs> they better have fun. It takes a lot of patience mm -hmm. dealing with foreigners from all over the place. <laughs> it's true. 
yeah, everybody comes with a different idea and they all sort of gradually help you focus in on what's what's important and what needs to be done. I do remember her imp impressing on us um, going slowly. We were all very, very keen to start. And uh, at the beginning, when we arrived at the residency, we didn't even know where the studio was. And, you know, for the first two days, we didn't know where the studio was. And then it oh, was, she didn't tell you? She didn't tell us. And yes. it, was sort of, yeah. it was a slow reveal. And it was just trying to kind of get us to slow down and to leave the West behind and just slow down and become a bit more mindful of where we were, what we were doing. It's really good. Yeah, I think it was important to her to be away from the city and away from contemporary life. I think she liked the Nagasawa Park program because it was, was nowhere. Oh my God. So Milab was a little more convenient to Tokyo, but still very much in the country where you could participate in Japanese life without, without much um, contemporary life intruding. I can see Elizabeth as a, she has raised your hand. Elizabeth Strom, do you want to ask a question? Yeah, since we are talking about Keiko and Mila, I wonder when will it be possible to go back there? Uh, I understood there was some financial topics. So. You mean but to Mila? It's still or... uh, running. And... You, 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 you mean to Mila or to Japan? To Mila specifically? To Mila, yeah. So I think the last year they opened the calls for. Well, of course, they had to stop for coronavirus, but last year I sort of saw they made some calls for what should have been the early summer session of 2022. And I did oh, not I saw see. that call, yeah. And That's on the, the website. I, yeah, I, I think know that, yeah, yeah, one of my former students got in. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, actually, as far as I know, if one Japan of well. opens, it, it's, it's scheduled, but who knows, oh, you that's know, even moment. in 2022. And Japan was supposed to, well, there were, were voices that were supposed to open in spring. So hopefully the, the program would have run smoothly, but um, I guess we'll see. But they're still running. I mean, uh, Ed Office is working and, uh, Sato-san and Keiko, Keiko Kobayashi are running thing. But now Japan itself is closed. So even if the program runs, there won't be, able, no one can go. I suppose there are a few people. Does anyone know who's been attending the conference? I see a few, a small audience of, a small international audience in Nara. Mariko is there because she's currently in Tokyo. And I saw um, Julie Stratum. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Oh, Mia. Oh, oh is Mia. Yeah. Mia, Mia is there. Oh, train down from Tokyo. And Terry McKenna from Kanazawa. Uh, Terry McKenna. The oh, yes, yes. But he With lives Terry. in Japan. Yeah, he lives in Japan, yeah. But also, so he, yeah. He helped hang the show, I heard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, he helped a lot. Great. I mean, uh, and do, do you, you know Hiro, uh, Hiroki Satake? Um, he helped hang the, well. The as well. Yeah. So people have been pitching in this, with this inability to travel. Oh, uh, Keiko Hara. Keiko, how about, will you be doing the, um, will you be doing the um, um, program in Walla Walla? You're, you're muted. I'm trying. Yes, hi. I mean, we're talking, we, we, it doesn't look like we're gonna get to Japan anytime soon. But you have a wonderful training program. 
Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, I think it's a still, they are really kind of cautious about In the Japan. whole situation. Yes. But it's improved tremendously. So I think it's kind of have a hope. You know, possibly mm -hmm. we can go in the near future, I hope. For the Walla Walla program. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Walla Walla, we have next summer. We are going to have one. Ooh, we can I come? Yes. Yes. So great. <laughs> she has a wonderful program there. Um, yeah, with that, but you probably will have difficulty getting Japanese teachers to come to the U.S.? Oh, actually, um, uh, uh, <laughs> Shoichi. Shoichi is coming. Oh, excellent. I would yes. love to see him. Yeah. I watched Shoichi Kitamura's sharpening demonstration last night. Yes. Ah, wonderful. Yes. He's uh, amazing. Yeah. And uh, also, we just uh, kind of... Uh, Publishing second uh, edition print by him uh, for a uh, New York artist, Dan for Grosskart. Donald Gross Grosskart. Yes, the same artist. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Yes. Yeah, it was great to see him. Yes, I am really looking forward, and we are really making a plan for exhibitions and. Uh, some programs. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Because that that level of that level of master printing requires so much creativity on the part of the printer, the carver and the printer. Yes. Yes. Really it's really a different uh, level of, of production. Very yes. wonderful to watch. Yes, also he's a really kind of a uh, 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 understanding, um, uh, you know, Mokanga uh, uh, artist and uh, uh, master printer, but also he's uh, very good to share with the other people. Generous, all, yeah, yeah. Yes, very generous, all different instructions and uh, input. And he laughs. We were saying how Keiko was so great because she could laugh. And I think uh, Kitamura also, you see him having yes. a good time, enjoying sharing his expertise. Yes. Yeah, we are looking forward to having him here oh, that's again. Awesome. I, I would love to, to see him. I, I think Goto-san yes. shares that generosity and sense of humor. Mm -hmm. Yes, he was. Yeah. Uh, he was uh, outstanding, um, you know, uh, for sharing his uh, all, you know, uh, craftsmanship and, uh, you know, it's just the kind of thoughts and everything. I, I think, it, uh, you know, we had a really great time in uh, Hawaii. Oh, <laughs> Hawaii was amazing. Oh, I keep telling everybody, I stayed with with uh, Goto and Keiko Hara at a beautiful little house when I taught in Hawaii at Donkey Mill. Mm 